Hello, um, I'm Elise Brogan. I'm a GP in Derbyshire at Crouch. I'm working part time and also doing a fellowship. Um, and that's where Gail comes in. We, as part of my fellowship, we've been having little talks about the updates that have happened each day during the COVID pandemic. So, would you like to introduce yourself, Gail? Hi, I'm Gail Walton. I'm a GP partner in Ilkeston in Derbyshire. I'm on the uh, LMC and GP task force exec. And that's where I come into this, helping uh, with the fellowship scheme. Thank you very much, Gail. Thank you, as always, for joining me um, and talking things through with me. It's the 8th of May. I was just check checking it then on a Friday. Um, so a few of the things that have come out this week. One was mentioning again about the care homes. Um, I think you're saying some more information is coming out again today. Yes, yeah, so we've talked over the weeks about the increased support available to care homes and we talked briefly last week about uh, an extra addition to that service running for the next um, three to six, six months, I think it's six months, uh, that the CCG have now put together a specification for and that's been rolled out to the PCNs through their clinical directors today. I think there'll be some anxiety about the fact that it looks like quite a lot of paperwork to fill in and get back in a short time spell. I think the important part of this is that it is additional resource. There is additional money there to fund. It was based on additional GP time, equating to roughly 20 um, full-time GPs um, for the next months. Actually, that's it's not as specific as to be just GP cover. So there will be other bolt-on services that will come into that specification and out of the um, funding ring fenced for it. So although, like with most CCG specs, we our first reaction is obviously oh it's additional work for us there is other workforce there and this is really to support the care homes the existing care home teams um and obviously the the patients in those those homes so i think it's a good good service there's work to be done around it to make sure it works well and i think like with most things across the county because we're a, a diverse population with different needs what we've got at the moment does look different and will continue to look different the way we manage care homes whether it's one practice to one home one practice to a number of homes one home being looked after by a number of practices or indeed frailty teams so there are very different models and I think the hope is really to take the best of each of those models and, and share it a bit more widely. We've not always been as good as we could have been perhaps about sharing what would work well regardless of geographical setting and um, and I think that's a side line, isn't it, to everything we've experienced through the pandemic is we've got a lot better at using technology, sharing ideas, rapid information sharing. So that's a very long answer to a short question. <laughs> no, I think that is useful. So we'll see kind of what happens over the next few weeks and months with that. But really good to know that there will be resources there and we don't have to do everything on our own. So that's the other yeah. Um, the next thing we were just going to mention, weren't we, was about the shielded patients, because that's been in some of the GP task force update emails, was mentioning them. Um, is there anything you could mention on that front? I've become quite confused and then had some clarity about it when I've read something and then I've got myself confused again. Um, I think the best guidance I've read is A from the, the bulletin um, um, and B um, that often refers us back to the BMA stroke GPC guidelines um, Richard Vautry update of a couple of days ago gave some good links and a bit good information about the shielded patients so 
I know practices have been doing their own searches and, and looking on codes for any gaps that there might have been in those original series of, of letters. Um, but I'll send you that link so that could, could yeah. go out of, of help. And uh, just the point that that makes that the um, highly vulnerable group should be shielded till the end of June. Like, which yeah. sounds like a bit of a psychological nightmare doesn't it um to to those patients and to those their family members and care but um that is the the guidance at this present time mm, it, yeah it, it must be really hard for them um okay well that that would link would be really useful thank you gail um the other thing which kind of linked into what you're saying about the care homes and the way that we've been sharing information and the different IT that we've used over the past few weeks and months. Um, we were talking about next steps for practices and things that we might be thinking of. Um, in my practice, I know we're thinking about redoing um, how we manage patients completely and bringing in a lot more telephone triage. What kind of steps are your practice taking or what are you thinking about doing? So, yeah, we're absolutely with you on that thing about using remote consultation a lot more over the years <clears throat> excuse me we've tried different uh, things we went down a system once of uh, something called stour triage where everything was triage pre-covid our uh, all our on the day requests were telephone triaged by our amps we've seen much better use of IT, especially the video consults and the um, uh, Accurix use for Med3s being emailed to patients. So those are the things that we're certainly sticking with. I think like most practices, we're at that phase where we're thinking, what do we do moving ahead? There's a little matrix grid that has been circulated um, by the CCG but it's it comes out of some management style work um, nationally I think and it's 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 almost like a SWOT analysis it's what were we doing that we have to drop because of the pandemic and we'll take up what have we started doing that will continue what were we doing that we will just don't need to be doing and what are the other opportunities so I can send you that it's a useful mm -hmm. sort of thinking about about things like I say I think all practices are thinking we need to keep the impetus going of what what's working well we don't want to slip back into old ways of working and it's a bit about educating ourselves and educating patients to say comfortable as it might have seemed pre-covid knowing that this is what it all looks like it wasn't actually working terribly well in a lot of of areas of our working lives and we need to um i was going to say convince not convince we need to reiterate that things have changed and are going to stay changed in some some regards yeah it's, it's been a really strange time but it has brought a lot of change and it would be great to take the positives forward wouldn't it yeah i think the the change has been so rapid that we couldn't have wished for some of the it advancement and the um agreement across boundaries of professional groups to, to push things through we'd have been still stuck in some debates around data patient confidentiality yeah. um, protection confidentiality you know all that information governance stuff which we're happy it's safe now and we've we've moved through some of that debate so i think that's really positive yeah no, I completely agree. Um, and the final thing we were just going to mention was about well-being, because again, there were lots of links on the email, I think it was yesterday, um, including things about Thrive, the Thrive app. Um, I know you've been heavily involved with the well-being, Gail. Um, is there anything you could tell us about that? 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of information out there, isn't there? And, and it's looking a lot nicer in terms of presentation. Not not mine, I have to admit, <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff now from NHS England and the BMA and um, DCHS and, and the um, Foundation Trust. So there's a lot of resource to tap into. We were talking off camera a bit about this, weren't we, and saying it almost feels as though we've had this huge adrenaline rush in the early weeks of the pandemic. We've had to get to grips with practice organisation, Red Hub, Green Hub working, planning for staff absence due to illness or isolation, having the fears of will we become ill ourselves, will we have family who are seriously ill, what will that feel like? So there's been this huge amount of work to do and we're now at that stage where it hasn't it hasn't been as bad for general practice in terms of the numbers of patients we've seen as we thought it might be mm -hmm. and we've had a little bit of thinking space and actually coming down slightly off that adrenaline rush and having the thinking like we were saying just now about what happens next we can all feel quite flat and um tired fatigued wondering when we can get out of lockdown and do different things so i think it's not it's not unusual and it's not abnormal for us all to be feeling as though we might need some support what that support looks like looks different for all of us doesn't it sometimes it'll just be a WhatsApp with a friend, it could be in a peer group like First Five or through the other task force schemes we've got going, it could be through GPS and they had still got rapid access GPS there for a 10 minute, 30 minute, one hour talk. Um, it could be one of the apps like you said about Thrive. Um, I think it's just that awareness that if people are feeling the need some support, there is a lot of support available. And it may be that just through GPS or um, similar, people can be signposted uh, accordingly. So I think like we said, when we first started talking, you know, the routine, the eating well, sleeping well, making the most of the sunshine, the bank holiday, the good weather, the garden, laying the patio slabs, which I'm going to be doing for the next 72 hours. It's really important just to be, <laughs> be self-aware and just, you know, there is, there's help, help there. And we're all going through a very unusual, unusual time. Yeah. Yeah, I think it, just as you say, it's, it's doing the basics, isn't it? Looking after yourself a little bit and not putting too much pressure on ourselves and, just trying to be a bit kind to ourselves. Yeah, and I think at work as well, I don't know whether you're finding it that because you haven't got that punctuation to the session of one patient in, one patient out, an interruption to sign something, a task to ask you to do something else, another patient in, out, you haven't got that sort of timetable really um and so there's the temptation to just do another remote medication review or another something or other another care plan have a look at another respect form and you forget to get up stretch your legs yeah. and, you know there's no patient to wander off to call in if that's what you do um coffee breaks are distanced but really important um and it, it, it's kind of you be aware of your own timetabling needs really yeah and no, i think that's right we haven't the day has changed the structure is not the same anymore is it so yeah i think mm, yeah, mm. it's important to to think about that at work as well as at home 
yeah yeah absolutely yeah well thank you very much Gail that's been really useful as usual um, have a lovely bank holiday and good luck with those paving slabs <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's been you this week I'm quite sad <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, you've locked them away and yes, no, no, them yeah. yeah no children sneaking through today <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll talk soon yeah thanks a lot gail bye bye okay bye bye, -bye.